Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim, Chapter 9, Halacha 1. This is Part 2 of this year in the Arch Girl. We're on 76A1. Today we're getting into Nagayim. And we learned before in the Mishnah that no fiber can get Tuma through Nagayim other than wool and linen. And to recap, when you speak Loshan Hara, your clothing can get this spiritual sickness. Your house can also get this spiritual sickness. And if you don't learn your lesson and don't repent, eventually it'll go on to you. So the first stop is going on to your clothes. Now, the only garments that are going to get this is going to be linen and wool, not shatnets, because you can't wear shatnets. But wool garments that are just wool and linen garments that are just linen. And by the way, it's not going to be like a mixture, right? So if it's going to be a blend of camel hair and linen, it's not going to get nagayim. It's just going to be your linen garment. So the Gemara wants to know, where do we know this from? In other words, how do we know that uh, Tuma can only come on to garments that are wool or linen? And the Gemara looks at a scriptural source for it, and it actually is in Vayikra, in Leviticus 13.47. And it says over there like this, it says, And a garment, when there shall be a tsaras affliction in a garment of wool, or in a garment of linen. And by specifying wool or linen, the verse is excluding other garments from the laws of Nagayim. And by the way, it says a garment of wool or linen. Again, not wool and linen, because that is Shatnitz. So we see here that it has to be wool, or it has to be linen. And the Gemara is going to look at a brysa that is going to get deeper into this limits of the fabric regarding to Nagayim. And I actually thought that this back and forth on the sugi was actually really interesting because I learned something in it, and I think you will too, in how the scripture is constructed and how we came up with the following law. In other words, I think that they're, they're really using these scriptural uh, exegetical tools. We, we see that there's 32 of them from Rabbi Lazar, and there's, there's like a really a lost art on how to do it. We see that in the Yershami and a good example of how we're going to be pulling out halaha through the diktuk and through the scripture is coming up. So the Gemara says in this brisa that it might be taught that garments can contract tuma through nagayim, whether they are dyed or undyed. So in other words, what about if you have a wool garment that's dyed? Is that going to contract tuma? What about, uh, I'm sorry, or going to become uh, it's going to get uh, tsaras affliction from it? Or what about linen? What if the linen garment is dyed? Got another question for you. Wool is normally going to be white. Well, you know, I've seen black sheep, and they do have natural sweaters that are naturally from black sheep, and they don't dye it. Well, what about that? It's not going to be white. What about something that's speckled? Well, you know, we see that uh, in the story of uh, Yaakov, Yaakov is watching the goats and the, the sheep, and the sheep become and have speckles and, and different patterns and things. What about something like that if the sheep is going to be mottled and so it's not pure white? Is that going to count as dyed? So the Gemara says that the Torah therefore states, in a garment or wool, or in, in a garment of wool or a garment of linen, and this establishes a heckish that compares wool and linen. And this is teaching that just as the linen to which the verse refers to is as it is created, in other words, in the natural undyed state, so too the wool to which this refers to is as it is created in the natural undyed state. So it's not common to dye linen. And when the verse is mentioning a garment of linen, it's understood as linen in the natural undyed state. And the heckish here, because again, there's really two heckishes, right? It says a garment of wool, that's going to be one, or a garment of linen, that's going to be a second. And by the way, it's not connected with an and. We saw in the end of chapter eight, all of the details of what happens when you have two things connected with an and. 
This is not connected with an and. This is connected with an or. And so you have a heckish dealing with wool things and a heckish dealing with linen things. And it's not wool and linen together. So the Rosh Cerulio is going to say about this that he would think that the heckish would serve to teach that wool must be in the natural state like linen and not that it must be white like linen. So the Bryce is going to continue. Again, we see that, okay, this has to be, if it's going to contract this too much, it has to, it has to be in the natural state. Okay, fine. Bryce continues, and it says, I would exclude only wool that was dyed by human hands, but I would not exclude wool that uh, was dyed at the hands of heaven, like the black wool of black sheep. So the Torah is going to say like this. It's going to say in the next statement, it's going to say, of the linen or the wool. This is in Vaikra 1348. This is a little bit uh, later on. Before we were talking about uh, Vaikra 47, now we're talking about Vaikra 48. And so having stated in the last verse that saras can occur in a garment, the Torah adds something new. It says, or in the warp or the woof of the linen or the wool. And the warp and the woof is what you're using on the loom. Uh, one is going to be for going uh, up and down, and the other is going to be going for left and right. And since the Torah is competing, uh, is repeating this comparison between linen and wool, we're learning here that wool has to be completely like linen. And the Gemara continues and says, just as linen is naturally white, and that's because flax is going to only grow at white, in white, there's no black flax that's naturally occurring, so too the wool that is subject to Nagayim is that which is naturally white. In other words, we're learning from this extra uh, pasuk that is in Vaikra 1348, one pasuk earlier, that only white wool or linen, which is always going to be white, is going to be subject to the Tuma of Nagayim. So what are we learning here? That if you have wool that comes from a black sheep, that's not going to be subject to the laws of Nagayim. Now, we're going to get into something I thought was even more interesting. And I, I think that uh, we're going to see more about how the diktuk works. So the Gemara says, we learn two principles in our Mishnah, and they are not similar to each other. And take that to heart. That is true. There's two things going on here. So the first is going to be like this. We learn no fiber is prohibited because of kalayim other than wool and linen. And the law of kalayim pertains to those fibers, whether they are dyed white or they, they, are, they are dyed or they are white. Now, there's a difference. And the Gemara says the second thing. And it says, and we also learned no fiber contracts tuma through nagayim other than wool or linen, but the law of nagayim pertains to wool and linen only as long as they are naturally white. So two things going on here. Kalayim can be only wool and linen, and it doesn't matter if it's dyed. It can be dyed, and it can be whatever color, and if it's mixed, that garment is a Kalayim Shatnitz garment, you got a problem. But with regards to Tuma through Nagayim, those are only wool garments, or those are only linen garments. Obviously, they're not mixed because you can't have Shatnitz garments. And the idea is that the law of Nagayim is different than the wool or the linen mixture because that has to be naturally white. In other words, that sheep had to be a white sheep, and that linen is always going to be white, and it's not going to apply to dyed garments, and it's not going to apply if you have, like, a black sheep making a black sweater. So this distinction gets examined. So again, we see that there's a difference here between the garments of Kalayim with the color that can be dyed, and we see that the garments that contract Tuma through Nagayim are only going to be wool or linen, and that's, again, sheep's wool. 
and it also has to be naturally white. So that's a little bit different. Rabbi Yonah of Batra asked of Rabbi Matta and said, there in the context of Kalayim, you say that the law pertains whether the fibers are dyed or white. So in other words, regarding uh, the, the laws of Kalayim and Shatnitz, doesn't matter. You can, you can dye your Shatnitz garment blue, and that's still going to be a problem. In fact, you can even dye the wool blue, and you can dye the fiber from the flax. You could dye that red, and you can mix it together. That's still going to be a problem. So the Gemara continues, says, but here in the context of Nagayim, you say that the law pertains only when they are white. And the, Rabbi Yonah wants to know, where is he getting this from? I thought this was really interesting. So in other words, what's the basis of the distinction? And since both scriptural passages are mentioning wool and linen, why do the sages understand that in the Nagayim passage that's going to link wool to linen through a heckish and is going to refer only through naturally white wool and the understanding of Kali the Kalayim passage does not link the fabrics and is going to be referred to as even you know, as referring to even dyed wool. So Rabbi Matt is going to explain what's going on here, and I thought that this was really brilliant. So he says to Rabbi Yonah, it is different regarding Nagayim, because in that passage, Scripture repeated the term saying wool and wool twice, and in each case, it linked wool to linen. So in the first, again, this is talking about 1347 in Vaikra. And there's a repetition that comes up later on in the Gaim in Vaikra 1359. So the phrase of garment of wool or linen is repeated in the Torah. And that first comes up in Vaikra 1347. That's what we're talking about. But the repetition when we're talking about the Gaim in Vaikra 15, uh, 1359 is going to conclude the passage about Nagaim garments and read like this, that this is the law of the Saras affliction in a garment of wool or linen. You notice that? That that is only mentioned one time. In other words, the Saras affliction in a garment of wool or linen is mentioned once. And in the other time, it's repeated for the dealing with Shatnitz. So the Gemara says that we can infer that just as the linen to which the verse refers to is as it was created in the natural undyed state. So too, the wool to which it's referring to is as it was created in the natural undyed state. And we can basically infer, says Amara Fulda, that just as linen is naturally white, so too the wool must naturally be white. And since there's no repetition found regarding the laws of Kalayim, that prohibition applies to all wool and linen garments, even if they are dyed. So the idea here, says Marapulda, is since in the Nagayan passage in, 13, in Vaikra 1359, that there's an extra mention of wool and linen, we're explaining that the verse is linking wool to linen, that's going to be the first time, and then teaching that the wool must be in the natural undyed state like ordinary, wool, ordinary linen. So this single mention over when we're dealing with shatnitz is understood as simply describing fibers that constitute shatnitz. So it's not establishing heckish, and that's why uh, there's there's no prohibition for uh, you know you know dyed dyed garments. So if you have a dyed garment that's shatnitz, it's shatnitz. But over here with Nagayim, it has a repetition of wool and linen. And that extra repetition of wool and linen that's not over here in the in the Shatnitz passage, that's what that's trying to say is that's trying to say that that's occurring in the natural undyed state with, with Nagayim because of the repetition. And when it's occurring only one time, talking about wool and linen, that's dealing with that, hey, if it's Shatnitz, it can be any color, even dyed, that there's no problem. Now, the mission is going to move on, and it's going to get into the garments of the Kohenim, and it says that the, the Kohenim do not wear for the service in the temple any fiber other than wool and linen. And the Gemara is going to look at a scriptural source for that statement. Rabbi Zerah said, 
it is written with regards to the garments worn by the Kohen, Kohen Gadol, that by the way is going to be eight garments, uh, when he entered the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, a sacred tunic of bod he shall don, breeches of bod shall be upon his flesh, uh, with a bod sash he shall gird himself, and with a turban of bod shall cover his head. So uh, when, he's, uh, when he's normally doing uh, the service, he has eight garments, and when he goes into the Holy of Holies, some of the garments he takes off, and, and then he gets back dressed uh, again when he comes out. This is in Yoma. And in Vaikra, this is, this is the term bod. And it's in Vaikra 16.4, and it's written regarding the ordinary garments of the ordinary cone. And Rabbi Zera is citing the verse referring, referring to the cone gadol on Yom Kippur. And what this is saying is that the, the bod emerges from um, uh, when we're talking about the cone gadol going in to the Holy of Holies. So in other words, he's only going to be wearing linen when he goes into the Holy of Holies. So the Hebrew term says this Gemara bod, which means individual refers to linen. Why? Because it grows individually. This, by the way, uh, you can find uh, uh, talked about in uh, the, when it's talking about the garments in the second Yoma. So also the, the bod is mentioned uh, in the second sukkah as well. So it grows individually. That's the idea. In other words, each stalk of flax, when it gets processed, is going to grow separately. And one stalk is produced by one seed. And therefore, we know that the garments worn by the Kohen Gadol when he entered the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur were made of linen. So again, the Kohen Gadol normally wears eight garments. Some of it's going to have wool in it. And the regular cone has four garments. Now, the Kohen Gadol, when he's going to go into the Holy of Holies, has to do a, a, a outfit change. And he has to only go in with the garments that are going to be linen. He can put on the other, uh, the the rest of the garments when he when he exits. He's not allowed to have wool in there. So the Gemara, the Gemara is going to question this assumption that only linen can be described as an individual. And the Gemara says, but wool also grows individually. In other words, each hair from the sheep grows from a single follicle. So that means that maybe the Kohen Gadol's garments should also be made of wool. So the Gemara is going to answer that it was explained in the received word. Received word means from Nubuah and the prophets. And where it says, wool shall not be upon them when they serve inside the gates of the inner courtyard within. This is in Ezekiel 44, 17. So the inner courtyard within is talking about the Holy of Holies. And the verse says over from Ezekiel that the Kohen Gadol should not wear any wool when he serves in the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And when the verse is talking about the garment of Bod, that means that linen. So yeah, okay, fine. The wool might come from a single follicle from a sheep. That's fine. But we have Ezekiel saying a tradition that, well, it has to just be linen. So when we're talking about Bod, we're talking about that it has to come from a single stalk, and it has to be a single material. So that's going to be excluding uh, wool. Now, we wouldn't know that this is excluded without Ezekiel writing down what the tradition is at this point, saying that, no, this, this bod only means, uh, only means linen. Don't interpret it as being this, where you could say, oh, it comes from a single follicle of a sheep, and perhaps it could be coming from... The, the, the animal, and it, it can't be. So the Gemara now wants to derive from the same verse in Ezekiel that some of the garments worn by the Kohanim did have wool. So the Gemara says that by stating wool should not become a Kohen inside the gates of the inner courtyard within and in the Holy of Holies, the verse implies and says, but when serving outside the Holy of Holies in the Hegel or in the courtyard, wool should be upon them. So what we're learning here is that the garments of the Kohanim are made only of 
the two materials, either linen or wool. And the, the, the scriptural analysis of this is like this, that since the verse states that wool should not be upon them, this is teaching that although wool was worn by the Kohanim at other times, like when they're serving outside of the Holy of Holies, that it should not be worn by the Kohen Gadol when he goes in the Holy of Holies. So the idea is that if the Kohanim and the, the garments of the Kohen contain any other materials, then the verse would have specified an exclusion on that material as well. And since it's excluding only wool from the Kohen Gadol when he's going into the Holy of Holies, Scripture is teaching that those garments also uh, contained linen or wool. In other words, we're learning here that the ordinary garments contained nothing except for either wool or linen. Very interesting. Now, the Gemara is going to ask more about the, the garments of the Kohanim and more of the, of the outfit. So from where do we learn that it's derived that the Kohanim are permitted to wear vestments of Kalayim when performing the temple service? In other words, so far we've demonstrated that the garments for the Kohanim can either be wool or linen. And how do we know that some of these are going to have in the same garment both linen and wool? That, by the way, is Kalayim. So this, by the way, is not just permitted, but it's actually commanded. The Torah says how you're supposed to make each garment. And so some of these garments have the commandment to make it Kalayim and to wear Kalayim while you're doing the Avoda. Now, you're not allowed to wear this garment at any other time, just when you're doing the Avoda. Now, from where do we know that... Uh, this can be, uh, you know, during the temple service. The Gemara says it is written in Exodus and the Kohen Gadol's turban of Sheish and the ordinary Kohen's pare, which is going to be splendor, uh, splendid headdresses of Sheish and the linen breeches of twisted Sheish. This is in Exodus 39.28. And the next verse says, and the belt of twisted sheish and techeles are gamam and tolas shani. Now, it's not exactly clear what our gamam is. We know what color it is, but we're not exactly sure which animal it comes from. And some of the Rishonim are saying it has to come from an animal. And the Rambam is saying that it can come from any living thing as long as it so even a plant, even as long as uh, it's a living thing, and the and it and it produces that color, and the tolas shini, it's going to be the same argument. Some are saying that um, this is going to be like a, a red worm, and it's unclear uh, exactly what species this is, um, and then we have the techelis to get this like this. Um, this like light blue color. You can get a similar color from indigo, but again, uh, we're seeing that uh, from the Rambam's explanation of this, that Rambam is saying that for the Techelis, that the preferred way is to come from the, the hill zone, which is, uh, which is gonna be this animal, this little like snail-like animal. And then uh, we, we have a, a thing of, you know, that it's coming from the blood of this uh, chilazone and a similar dye can come from indigo. But we're learning this comparison of tolas shini that only the blood of the chilazone is going to be valid. And one might think that that would be the same for the argamom and that it also has to come from a living creature. But, you know, again, the rambam is indicating that any dye of the proper color can be used for argamom and the Ravad is implying that any turquoise dye may be used to produce uh, techelis for the, the vestments of the Kohen, uh, but only chilazone can be used for the tzitzis. Very interesting. So the Gemara cited a verse in Ezekiel that states, wool shall not come upon them for the Kohenim when they serve in the gates. And this, by the way, is in, again in Ezekiel 44.17. And the same verse continues and says that they shall wear linen clothes. And from the fact 
that in the garment of the Konim's clothing, linen is mentioned together with wool, the Gemara is going to derive a law. It's going to say, just as the wool to which the verse has no accompanying name, in other words, whenever scripture mentions wool, it means ordinary sheep's wool. It doesn't refer to like goat's wool, because it would say goat's wool or ram's wool. So too, the linen to which it refers to has no accompanying name. And what does that mean? That means that you can't have in the garments for the cone, you can't have like hemp fiber, or you can't have silk. You can't have this other kind of fiber coming from a reed. So what we're seeing is that only linen is going to be there. And when the verse says linen, it only means from flax. And when we're seeing from sheep's wool, uh, where it's the, the Torah and the Tanakh is going to say wool, it only means from the sheep. And if it's going to have an accompanying name like ram's wool or goat's wool, then it's going to be from that specific animal instead of the sheep. Same is going to apply for the linen. What we see here is that only wool and linen are used for these garments. You can't have some other material in there. Now, what happens if you blended camel's hair and sheep's wool and the majority of the mixture had camel's hair in it? That's going to be permitted with linen. Now, this is going to come for other applications of the ruling. And Rabbi Yonah and Ula Bar Ishmael said in the name of Rabbi Lazar that if somebody blends together raw wool and flax, that mixture is forbidden. So what should he do to permit the mixture? And the Yershami does this a lot. Yershami, especially in Zerayim, uh, Seder Zerayim, goes through what happens if you have a mixture? How do you fix the mixture? And the Gemara is going to say like this, assuming that it has at least a liter of wool, he should bring no more than a liter of camel's hair and add it to the mixture and nullify the wool fibers. In other words, you can nullify it. So by blending in the camel's hair into the wool, now what do you have as a garment? You really don't have a wool garment anymore that's mixed with linen. You have a camel hair garment that's mixed with linen, and that's not going to be shatnitz. That's the point about mixing it. Now, there's a related discussion, and there's some nuance on what's coming up. Abba Bar Rav Huna says in the name of Rabbi Yermia that if someone blends together raw wool and flax, he nullifies them. Now, that's very curious because it looks like, wait a second, says Rabbi Kanievsky, it would look like he's saying that if somebody's blending in more raw wool and flax so that the flax will become nullified or vice versa. In other words, it's not, let's say, 50-50, let's say it's 75-25. And then you'd say, well, maybe it sounds like he's saying that if you have a preponderance of one fiber over the other, maybe it's going to nullify the mixture. Maybe you would say that, oh, it's really just a wool garment. There's a little bit of shatnitz. There's a little bit of linen in there, but it's really just a wool garment. That's really not where uh, Rabbi Yermia is saying. And in fact, uh, so he's saying he's nullifying them, and the nuance is going to get into exactly what does he mean. Now, Rob says about this that their mixture is forbidden, and that's what we understand, right? Even if you have a single strand of linen in a big wool blanket, the whole thing is shatnitz. The whole thing is going to be forbidden. So yeah, majority of it's going to be wool, and even just one little thread is going to be flax. As Rob is saying, that's that's uh, that's forbidden. So what really is Rabbi Yeremia's point? Because that seems like a very elementary point. What's he really trying to say? And actually, the Gemara asks and says, what is Rabbi Yeremia uh, saying, is he actually disputing Rav? And, and he's not disputing Rav. So the Gemara is going to answer that Rav and Rabbi Yermi are actually talking about two different things. And the Gemara says that what Rav says is dealing with where somebody made a mixture of fibers into a garment by itself, and they didn't add any other fibers into it. And in that case, there's no nullification, and the garment is forbidden as Kalayim. Now, what Rabbi Yermia says in this Gemara is dealing with a case where before making the blend into a garment or into a thread, somebody wants to mix it with other fibers like camel hair. And in that case, other fibers could nullify the wool or the flax and make the mixture permitted. So the Rosh Terilio points out that uh, really 
you know, he's he's like Rabbi Lazar. What Rabbi Lazar was saying about, oh, if you want to nullify it, just add in more flax. What Rabbi Yermia is saying is, in fact, Rabbi Yermia is going to agree with Rob that wool and flax do not nullify each other. And really what he's saying is that if you're going to blend wool and flax, he can nullify them by adding another fiber into the mixture. And so this Gemara really does uh, agree with Rabbi Lazar that wool and flax can't nullify one another uh, uh, when they're in the raw form, but the time the other fixed uh, fibers get added, they're going to nullify either the wool or the flax and make the mixture permitted. So regarding this case uh, where they're processing threads of wool and linen, it could become mixed with each other or another kind of thread. Now, the this does have a lot of uh, things for modern fibers today. What about recycled clothing? What about mixed fiber garments? So that's going to, uh, you know, really highlight the importance because manufacturing today for clothing is a lot different than how it used to be. That's why you really do need to send your suits and your garments over to get checked for shatnets because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, recycled fibers. What happens if you have a, a linen fiber that you know, is recycled, but the majority of it is linen and minority amount of it, say cotton or something like that. Well, if you've sewn that into a wool garment, well, you have shatnets. So we can see that there's a, a value to this today. And the Gemara is going to continue with some amazing, amazing examples about just how, how much damage shatnets can do. So Rabbi Hillel, the son of Rabbi Valas, had a fine garment worth 300,000 dinars. And he gave it to Rebbe as a gift. And Rebbe found Kaliam in it, and he burnt it. Now, this is a massive amount of money. And they're giving to the Nasi just a beautiful, beautiful garment of the highest quality. And, you know, this is talking about, you know, Rebbe finding a small amount of Kaliam like, the thread of wool in a linen garment, and since he could not wear the garment, he destroyed it. So Rebbe could have removed the offending thread and made the garment permissible, but he was concerned that there might be other such uh, threads hidden in the garment, so he acts stringently. So it's not, it, it is permitted to sell Kalayim to a non-Jew because Shatnitz is not forbidden for benefit. And also, if a non-Jew wears shatn, it's fine. But if the kalayim is not clearly uh, recognizable, somebody can't sell it. And that's from a Tesefita and also in Bavli Nita 61b. So, and it also is, is uh, corresponding with what the Yoridea is saying. Why? Because the concern that after that a Jew is going to go buy it, and the non-Jew is going to sell it, and the the not the, the Jew's going to buy the garment, not realizing that there's shatnets in it. So Rebbe was concerned that the garment contained hidden shatnets, and he had no recourse on how to fix it except to destroy it. Amazing story. A similar incident. Rabbi Manna had a garment worth 300,000 dinars, so it's also 300,000 dinars, and he gave it to Rabbi Hia Bar Ada, and Rabbi Hia Bar Ada found Kalayim in it, and he said to Rabbi Manna, you bought me a garment that's fit for a corpse. And, you know, since it's shatnitz, it's only permitted to be used as a shroud for a corpse. And Rabbi Hiabar Ada was not simply going to remove the offending thread because he's also worried that maybe there's hidden shatnitz in it. So what did he do with it? It remained with Rabbi Hiabar Abba Ada for safekeeping until he died. And he used it to be wrapped in it as a shroud. Now, there's a lot of interesting things here because you say, well, wait a second. It's forbidden for use. And now you're using it. You're wearing it, right? But hold on a second. When you're dead, you're, you're, you're excluded from mitzvahs. So now that he's dead, uh, he doesn't have to worry about shatnets. So that's an interesting point. And... The Gemara talks about another case illustrating a strict attitude toward shatnitz. And Rabbi Haggai said that when Shmuel Bar Yitzchak would bring a garment home from the launderer, 
uh, and where there were like 10 threads of different kinds clinging to it, he would not only remove those threads, but examine it for additional threads that might be shatnets. In other words, the guy goes and takes it to the laundry and he goes and he inspects his garment to make sure that there's not other threads from other garments on that got mixed into his clothing. Why? Because maybe he has a linen garment and maybe in the same laundry pit, the launderer is sitting there mixing in some wool and the wool and the linen mix up as he's doing the laundry to wash it around. And maybe some of the wool fibers get into the linen. Now you have a Shatnitz garment. So he would go and he would examine it uh, for, for after the laundry to make sure that there's no Shatnitz in it. And that's an amazing story. There's another practice by an Amara. Rabbi Chagai says that Rabbi Shmuel bar Rav Yitzhak would instruct his household not to place the loom for spinning wool besides the loom for spinning linen because of the worry that the threads might become attached and become woven into a garment and render it shatnitz. In other words, Pnei Moshe is saying that uh, there was a worry that the wool and linen strands could become combined into a cord and that it would become attached to a garment. And that's also an amazing thing. In other words, the concern to keep shatnets separated, make sure things don't turn into shatnets, was that serious where he would separate out the looms to make sure that they weren't even close to each other. But again, what these last two stories are showing is the worry about uh, accidental contamination. And the stories before that or with the garments, the expensive garments, is talking about hidden shatnets. The Mishnah talked about uh, Shirayim and Kalach, and that they're not subject to Kalayim by biblical law. What is that? Shirayim refers to silk, and Kalach refers to the Agvin of Caesarea. And this is a type of coarse silk that looks like wool. So the Rambam commentary in the Mishnah is saying that one is going to be fine silk, and one is going to be coarse silk. And there's another view on the second substance. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says, I inquired among all the seafarers as to what kalach was, and they said it's, the common name is kalchach. And this, says the Rosh Cerilio, is a soft woolly substance that has a golden color that grows on the rocks of the Dead Sea. And Rashi also uh, has a commentary on what Kalach is in uh, Shabbos 20, uh, 20b. So we're going to get more into the worries about uh, silks and Kalach in the next year. And we're going to go through some of the nuances that Rav has to understand this. Have a great day.